Welcome to the podcast service of Sydney's FM 103.2, available on the web at fm1032.com.au. Recently, I was talking to a highly intelligent woman who asked me about the sources of our knowledge about Jesus. Well, I took her through the Greco-Roman and Jewish sources that we talked about last night. And then I began to list the Christian sources about Jesus. And she stopped me and said, but surely you can't use those. They were all written by religious believers. She somehow got it into her head that religious devotion disqualified religious texts from being considered historical sources. Let me begin then by clearing up two major misunderstandings about the writings of the early Christians. Firstly, the so-called religious nature of the Christian writings in no way diminishes their value as historical sources. It's true that historians take the Christian agenda into account when they analyse the New Testament, just as they take the biases of Tacitus and Josephus um, into account when they're studying their particular writings. Um, Historians don't place the New Testament in a category all on its own. Professional scholars approach the New Testament as they would any other first century text. They don't treat it as the word of God, as I would and as the Christian church generally does, but they do accord it the status of a valuable historical text. In fact, it's no exaggeration to say that historians universally regard the New Testament writings, no matter what their persuasion, as the earliest, most plentiful and most reliable sources of information about the Jesus of history. The second thing to say is that the New Testament is not a single source at all. It's not as if we have these 11 non-Christian references to Jesus and only one Christian reference to Jesus called the New Testament. Not at all. Um, The New Testament is a collection of sources. In the discipline known as theology, the study of God's nature and activity, the Bible is appropriately treated as one homogeneous source, all ultimately coming from God. Passages from one biblical writer are placed seamlessly next to passages from another biblical writer in order to build up a coherent picture of God's character and intentions. Um, Sermons in church normally use scripture in this same way. But in historical research, the New Testament is analysed as a compilation of independent traditions with common convictions about Jesus of Nazareth. Christians need to remember that although our sacred documents appear today in a single volume, the New Testament, originally, you know, they were composed and circulated completely independently of each other. For example, the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 documents now in the New Testament, never knew, for instance, um, the Gospel of Mark. And Mark never knew the letters of Paul either. Historians therefore treat Paul's epistles and Mark's gospel as separate sources. Again, the Gospel of John was composed independently of the Gospel of Matthew, so these individual Gospels represent another set of sources. Um, James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote one of the letters of the New Testament, didn't know any of these Gospels, so his little letter gives us yet another source. Now, I don't mean to get too nerdy here, but did you know there are even sources within the Gospels? which historians treat as early, independent traditions pulled together into a later text. The Gospel of Luke, for instance, relies on at least three sources recognised by scholars. Firstly, the Gospel of Mark, which was probably written about ten years before Luke. Secondly, a document dubbed by scholars Q, which just stands for the German word Quelle, meaning um, source. Um, This contained numerous sayings of Jesus. The third source is a source dubbed by scholars L, um, which was a collection of parables and other reports about Jesus. Now, Luke himself, in the opening paragraph of his gospel, mentions his own investigation and awareness of prior sources. Here it is, Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of, of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, probably his patron, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. 
Now, whatever else this is, it is a claim to be writing as a historian about historical events using prior historical sources. Uh, In fact, Luke says that many have undertaken to draw up accounts of the things about Jesus and that Luke himself has studied them all. The modern scholarly identification of Luke's sources as Mark, Q and L is entirely consistent with what Luke himself says here. Other recognized sources for the study of Jesus within the New Testament include M, signs source, uh, the letters of Paul, the epistle of James, and a couple of other ones. To the general public, the fact that several parts of the New Testament say basically the same thing about Jesus doesn't seem all that significant. This is because most of us, if we ponder these things at all, are used to thinking about the New Testament as a single document. But as I said before, historians view things really quite differently. The fact that Paul, Mark, Q and L independently offer strikingly similar descriptions of Jesus' life and teaching is highly significant. Because we know these sources weren't just copied from one another, we assume that their information was both early and widely known. This is a basic principle of historical study, and it is known as the criterion of multiple attestation. How about that? That's something to put you to sleep. This basically says that when numerous ancient sources independently offer roughly the same portrait of an event or person, that portrait takes on greater plausibility. It's exactly the same logic you'd apply uh, to some surprising news from friends. If the same news came from two or three different friends and you knew they hadn't got together and colluded, you're far more likely to take them at their word than if it was just one friend with surprising news. Well, let me close with a couple of brief comments about the significance of all this historical stuff. I think there's something quite instructive in all this about the distinctive nature of the Christian New Testament when compared with the scriptures of other world faiths. The Islamic holy book, the Quran, for instance, is said to be a direct revelation from God entirely devoid of human participation in its composition. It's believed to be the perfect copy of the mother Quran stored in heaven. The prophet Muhammad merely recited what was divinely dictated to him. Um, The word Quran, in fact, means recitation. The earliest and most sacred portion of the Hindu scriptures, which are called the Vedas, are likewise believed to have been eternally and divinely disclosed. But Christian scripture is a little bit different. The books of the New Testament have always presented themselves in the first instance as historical texts. They are letters written to specific social settings. They are biographies based on earlier sources. Now, does this observation undermine the Christian belief that the New Testament is also the word of God? Not at all. From the very beginning, Christians treated their sacred documents as both human and divine at the same time. Just as Christian theology has had no problem thinking of Jesus as both God and man at the same time, so the church has generally had no hesitation in affirming the New Testament as both divinely inspired and a truly historical text. Christianity is a historical faith based not only on a divine dictation or private revelation of secret ideas. It's based on public events that are open to public scrutiny. Well, let me add a final personal challenge that I think arises from these historical observations. I would love to think that this Spectator's Guide to Jesus over the next few weeks is going to help you to explore the Gospels for yourself with the same mental discipline you'd give to any important documents from your own field, whether that's law or sport or medicine or carpentry or whatever it is. Now, I'm not saying we need to become experts or that the Bible should become arduous to read. I'm simply saying that readers of the Gospels can and should apply themselves to understanding the man from Nazareth with the same seriousness and attention to detail they would give to any other crucially important aspect of our professional or personal life. My question is, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to explore Jesus with your sceptical muscles fully flexed, with your brain in top gear? Because I think if you do that, you're going to be 
mystified, surprised and delighted by what you find. I'm John Dixon. We hope you enjoyed this FM 103.2 podcast. To listen to more great audio, visit FM 103.2.